Okay, as people are coming in, we've got another 30 seconds or so. Go ahead and start getting logged in. We'll start with the reading quiz today. Another 20 seconds or so, get your answers in. What does it mean for a hydrocarbon to be saturated? By the way, this is the same saturated, if you've heard of saturated fats versus unsaturated fats, it's talking about the same thing. Okay, we're going to wrap it up. Okay, it's correct. It means all the bonds are single bonds. Another way to think of it, it's saturated with hydrogens, right? If it had double bonds still, you could get rid of that double bond, make it a single bond, and add some more hydrogen, right? And then it would be saturated with hydrogens. How about this one? If a polymer chain is made up of two or more monomers, it is called a homopolymer, network polymer, copolymer, or branched polymer. Okay, I'm going to wrap this one up. People think copolymer. Yeah, that's right. Two thirds got that one right. Then the last one. Ah, I forgot to attach the image. I'm going to draw it. Hold that thought. <laughs> Well, that thought while I draw this thing. Okay, we're talking about this polymer. It's a carbon chain. You've got hydrogen and hydrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen. On this side, you've got a hydrogen, and then you've got this alternating R group. Hydrogen, hydrogen. This is an R group. That's hydrogen, that's hydrogen. Okay, and this polymer, as I've drawn it here, and it could go on and on and on. The question is, where to go? If R represents atoms other than hydrogen in the figure that I just drew, that figure, then this polymer is termed A, atactic, B, lopsided, C, isotactic, or D, syndiotactic.
Okay, another 30 seconds or so. Lopsided, isotactic, or syndiotactic, people think. Good, isotactic. Iso means the same, tactic, the same side. So that that other group is all on the same side. So we call that isotactic. Okay, let's pick up where we left off last time. Last time we didn't quite finish x ray diffraction. And x ray diffraction is way too important to just skip it. So we're going to talk more about it. Question though? Yeah, so we will get to that probably by later today, or if not on Wednesday. So we will come back to that. We'll talk about the difference between network, branched, copolymer, homopolymer. So we'll, we'll be covering that soon. Okay, with X ray diffraction, the fundamental principle behind it is that if your X ray wavelength light, when they enter the crystal and then when they exit the crystal, right, they're going to come in at some angle, say theta, and then they're going to bounce away at the same angle. That's called specular reflection, when something comes in an angle and then bounces off the same angle. So when specular reflection occurs, if, the, if all of those wavelengths of light, or x-rays, are coherent to start with, and then they're coherent when they leave, meaning that they're in the same direction, the same wavelength, uh, sorry, the same phase, so they're going up with, they're like this, right? <laughs> they're adding together, then you see a signal, right? And that only can occur at specific occasions, right? Because the, that will occur, uh, the geometry that tells us when that occurs has to do with the angle that it's coming in at, and it has to do with the separation between these different planes, right? The person who recognized that is Bragg, and that's why we call this Bragg's Law. So again, Bragg's Law says this, says that lambda, your wavelength of radiation that's coming in, in order to, to observe a Bragg reflection, meaning an X-ray reflection that we're going to use to characterize the material, in order to see that come out and for it not just to get absorbed in your material, then lambda must equal two times your interplanar spacing, whatever that spacing is, spacing is between these planes, multiplied by sine of theta. And this equation simply comes from the geometry of figuring out this path length, which I will start here, right? That path length, that distance right there, multiplied by two, so two of those distances, that path length right there and there, that is equal to two times d sine theta. If two times d sine theta is equal to an integer number of your wavelength, then you see your x-ray reflection. Yeah, Rosa? So does v have to be like the linear distance or does it have hotness of that Really good question. D is the linear distance between these planes of atoms, right? These are planes of atoms. And D is just the, the normal to those planes, right? The normal is going to go straight from one to the other, okay? That is D, okay? So D is not, uh, no, I'm sorry. D, D by definition is then is the hypotenuse of that triangle. You were right. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. Yeah, Arthur? What does the N represent? What does N represent? Good question. Well, if your wavelength of light coming in, let's say it's a really short wavelength, something like that. Well, you can imagine a scenario where this undergoes like many different wavelengths, but it still comes out the same. As long as it comes out the same, we don't care. So if that integer number is five or whatever, um, it will still be coherent as long as it's an integer number of wavelengths. Now, when you use this equation, you'll notice that I left out the N, right? Technically in the book, I think they write an N there. Just leave off the N. It's just gonna throw you off, right? If you just use n, meaning one wavelength, you'll be getting the right answer. But technically, yeah, it could be more than one wavelength. It could be two or three or five or whatever. Okay. When you use Bragg's law, just use lambda equals 2d times the sine of theta, where theta is in degrees. Yeah, Logan? So is our 2 theta value exactly 2 times? And exactly. When we plot this, uh, we usually plot intensity versus 2 theta. And that 2 theta is just whatever your theta value is multiplied by 2 in degrees. The reason is because when you have the x-ray diffractometer, you've got a source of x-ray radiation, 
shining light down on your sample, right? So this is our sample. X-rays are coming in. They hit your sample and there's specular reflection. So it comes in at angle theta and it leaves at angle theta. So technically there's two different theta values. I guess that's where it came from. It seems silly. They should have just done theta, but I don't know. Some barbarian came up with this and we've stuck with it. Stuck with it. Okay. Yeah. Can you remind me what that HKL stands for? Great question. HKL has to do with how we define our planes. It's called the Miller indices. And if we go back to planes way back yesterday, the Miller indices are these values, H, K, and L, right? So once you define a plane, right, or which is really defining a family of planes, let me get rid of that, right? These planes, in this case, the three, two, bar one planes, there will always be a separation distance between those planes. Now, if it's a really easy plane to visualize, like uh, like this one, it's easy to guess what d is going to be. d, again, is your inner planar spacing. It's just equal to your lattice parameter, right? It's just the separation between those planes. But a lot of planes aren't simple ones like that. It's not always like the 100 plane like this. It could be the 131 or the 132. And in those ones, we need to have a way to calculate that inner planar spacing for any arbitrary HKL value, right? That's what we're going to show you next. Any questions on this so far? Yeah, Rosa? So I have two questions. One, um, in that example right there, where is the origin? In this example? Uh -huh. um, good question. Depends on which plane we're talking about. If I'm going to try and draw this plane, I cannot put the origin along that line because one of our rules for drawing those is that the plane cannot intersect it. So I'd have to put the origin, say, here, right? And in that case, that plane would be what? Well, it doesn't intersect um, x ever or z, but it intersects y at negative 1. If I'm talking about this plane, then it intersects y at the positive 1. So that's a plane that's in the 100 family, and negative 100 is equal to 100 in this crystal system. So if you only have number 1 and you don't have a, a, a z or an x value, how do you know that the plane covers one whole side? That it covers one whole side. So because it, it never intersects the x or the z axis, sorry, the uh, yeah, the x or the z axis, there's no other way to draw a plane that won't intersect the x or the z axis, right? So here's our x axis. So we know it has to be parallel to it, but at the same time, it, that's our z axis, so it cannot ever intersect that, so it must be parallel with that. So the only plane that exists that is parallel to both, well, yeah, that is parallel to both of those is that plane right there. That plane, that plane, depending on where you put your origin. Okay. Um, and also, when you have like a mirror and light bounces off of it and you lose a little bit of light, um, does that happen with the energy of the waves and the X-ray refraction? Good question, right? So energy is coming in at some angle theta right here. It hits your sample and it's going to diffract and come off. So all we've said so far is specular reflection means that this angle is conserved. Right? It's theta over here and it's theta over here. We haven't said anything about intensity, what happens to the intensity. Some of the light does get absorbed. And if you uh, are interested in X-ray diffraction, we teach a course on materials characterization where you learn a lot more about the intensity. Right, So we showed you that the, the picture looks something like this. You've got intensity as a function of 2 theta. And these things are kind of go up and down all over. You learn what causes them to go up and down and up and down. Like Why are they not all the same intensity? You learn about that in that class, but we won't cover it in here. Okay, any other questions on diffraction before we move on? Yeah. <coughs> the wavelengths max into the average and then it bounces off. Yeah. So for the same reason that a wave, imagine like a wave which has a pretty big wavelength. Say like what's the distance between waves? Like I don't know. Uh, like in the ocean, I don't know, 10 feet, 20 feet, I don't know what it is. If that hits a pebble, it's not scattered. But if that hits something on the order of 10 to 20 feet in size, like a lighthouse or like a pier, then it will diffract. Right? So basically, if your incoming light has a wavelength which is at least kind of proportional to your separation between atoms, it will diffract. If you have something, you're, let's say your light is way bigger, like a radio wave. Radio waves, what do they do? They travel right through buildings and mountains. Well, we wish they traveled better through mountains, right? Because you lose them when you try through mountains. But they still go through right through this building walls, no problem, right? They don't diffract, they travel right through, okay? So if you cannot perform a diffraction experiment, if you didn't have x-ray light that was roughly commensurate with the size of atoms. So there's not like one wavelength you can use. You can actually use a band of wavelengths and still get diffraction, but not any light will work. You couldn't use visible light, for example, and perform x-ray diffraction. It has to be within a certain band. Visible light is 
right? Green is around 230 nanometers. 230 nanometers is way bigger than average interatomic spacings, right? These spacings are a couple angstroms, so that's like 10,000 times too large, or whatever the math is, 1,000, whatever it is. Okay, other questions I can answer? Okay, let's keep going then. Um, so again, there's our Bragg formula. Remember that D is a function of HKL. So how do we figure out what D is for any arbitrary HKL value? Well, we use this handy table, right? This table shows you for the seven different crystal systems, how do you calculate D for any given HKL value? And some of these are downright nasty, right? Triclinic is just horrible. I will not give you something like that on an exam. I will give you one of these top four, orthorhombic, tetragonal, cubic, or hexagonal. None of those are very hard to calculate. I won't give you monoclinic, triclinic, or trigonal. So you can just assume that I will not be giving you any of those three in this class for an exam. Yeah? Where is this table in the book? This table is, I think it's in one of the appendixes maybe. Um, otherwise I have it available here in the course notes, but I think it might be one of the appendixes in the back. And if it's not there, let me know. I can send you a link to a website that talks about it in greater detail, but I think it's in there. Yeah? Could you zoom in on that? Sure. So in this thing, let's just look at, uh, let's look at cubic for a minute. That's our easiest one. In the cubic crystal system, if you wanted to calculate D for any HKL values, it's pretty simple. It's 1 over D squared, and D is a function of HKL. That's equal to H squared plus K squared plus L squared, all divided by A squared, right? So if you know the lattice parameter of your system, right, remember the cubes, if you know that separation of these cubes, that's A, and if you know what the plane is you're talking about, the 3, 2, 1, or the negative 3, 0, 2, or whatever it is, you could solve for what the D spacing is just by plugging in that H, K, and L value and squaring them. So okay? Plane yeah, that's for your plane value. That's, uh, nothing to do with directions. That has to do with the Miller indices H, K, L values for planes. Okay? Any questions on using that? Yeah, Rob? Sorry, what was H again? Oh, sorry, what was A again? A is your lattice parameter. So again, if you have, um, let's zoom out a little bit. You've got your unit cells, right? Your lattice parameter in the cubic system, A is equal to A is equal to, going backwards is also equal to A. So the cubic one is the simplest one because there's only one lattice parameter to worry about. It gets more tricky when you consider, say, tetragonal. In tetragonal crystal system, all the angles are still 90 degrees, which is nice. But your A and your B in, the, in this plane are the same, and that's not equal to C. Your lattice parameter in, this, in the Z direction is different, right? So therefore, you have to take into account both A and C when you calculate D. Still not very bad. When you do um, hexagonal, same thing. You have to have A and C. It's got a new term because it's a hexagonal unit cell. Um, orthorhombic is the last one we'll consider. In that case, your three axes, your three lattice parameters in three different axis directions, A, B, and C, are all different. Therefore, you have to have different values right there for A, B, and C, right? Any questions on using this? Again, this is in the notes. If it's not in the back of the book, did you find it, Brennan? Is it there? It's not. So I will find a resource for you guys and, and link it, okay? Okay, that is how we figure out interplanar spacing. So now that we know interplanar, so if I give you any plane, I say, where will you expect to see the 100 reflection for copper? You say, okay, the 100 reflection, copper's cubic, it's face centered cubic, so we would just plug in HKL. So we can, in order to solve for D, all we need to know is the lattice parameter, right? So I'd have to give you the lattice parameter. And then to figure out where you observe your reflection at, theta, what else do you need to know? You can solve for D from the lattice parameter. T, T is a constant, but you need to know lambda, right? Lambda is the wavelength of the radiation that you use. And there's no one type of radiation that you can use, right? I said there's sort of a band. The most common, though, by far, radiation is copper, meaning an X-ray diffractometer, one of these units. Inside it somewhere is a, is a big copper block. They bombard this with energy, and it starts kicking off radiation, right? light from that thing, and it's going to have a very specific wavelength. Somebody remind me, and this goes back to the first day of class, why does it give off a specific radiation level energy? Anybody remember this? It goes back to EDS. Yeah, Jeff. Uh, I don't think it's because the electron is a specific energy base. It's exactly right. Remember, we, we gave the example of if you kick out someone at the, at the front of like a concert, somebody from further out who has a, a less good seat is going to want to come forward. 
So in terms of energy, we say we knock out an innermost electron, and so outer electrons say, hot dang, there's an empty seat. They drop down, and that difference in energy is very precise depending on what material you have. Therefore, the radiation that it gives off, since energy is conserved, has to be a very precise, well-known value. And copper just works out that it's pretty good. So that's the most common, but there's also cobalt and chromium and magnesium, all sorts of different radiation sources out there that you can use. And there are what are called synchrotron sources, which are big national labs that our country has built. There's six or seven of them right in this country. And that has tunable radiation where you can pick the radiation wavelength you want and you could dial up your X-ray diffraction for any arbitrary wavelength. Okay, any questions on any of this so far? Should we do an example? Okay, let's work a problem together. Okay, the click, uh, oh, I forgot to do this click. All right, this is not a clear question. We're just gonna work this one. What despacing in angstroms would you expect for the 211 plane in a tetragonal crystal system where A and C are given as follows? So again, your tetragonal is up there. I'm going to write it out so it's clearer. 1 over D squared is going to equal 8 squared plus K squared over A squared plus L squared over C squared, okay? So what D spacing do you get from that? Okay, everybody got an answer here? Okay, there's no, this isn't a clicker question. If you have, you have a question, anybody need help working this out? Okay, everybody got an answer ish. Read it more time. Or question? Okay. Who's got an answer that wants to throw it up? Thomas, what do you got? That's not what I got. What do you get? I'm getting 1.55. People getting that? So again, to plug to get that answer, I guess you'd say that's equal to the square root of Gosh, I don't want to write that all out. Well, let's say this. 1 over d squared is equal to 5. That's 4 squared plus 1 over 3.644 squared plus 1 over 5.201 squared. And then when you solve for d, I get that d equals 1.555 angstroms. OK? All right, let's keep going. So Bragg's law, meaning that your combination of D and the, the theta angle that it's coming in at, this is Bragg's law again. 
Bragg's Law is a necessary first requirement in order to observe a peak from diffraction, X-ray diffraction, but it's not a guarantee that you will observe diffraction for reasons that we will not cover in this class. You could have something that you expect satisfies Bragg's Law, but you still don't see a peak, right? So in this class, what we will introduce is there are some general rules, right? The general rules are as follows. If you have a body-centered cubic crystal structure, you only expect to see a diffraction peak when H plus K plus L equals an even number. And if you're talking about an FCC lattice, then you only expect to see a diffraction peak when H, K, and L are all either even or they're all odd, okay? Where zero is an even number, okay? Now, where do these rules come from? It's not, we're not gonna cover it in this course. There's mathematical reasons for, for the origin of these. We just won't get to them in this class. But we will do, use these. For example, how about this one? Let me get rid of the polymer. I no longer need you. Okay, if the question says for copper, what are the first, uh, sorry, when, at what two theta value would you observe the third peak, right? Third peak meaning if you were to start from two theta equals zero, and you're gonna <coughs> plot your intensity as a function of two theta, you're gonna see different peaks at different positions. I want you to tell me what will be the third peak for copper. I've given you the lattice constant for copper. It's cubic, therefore one over d squared is equal to h squared plus k squared plus l squared divided by a squared. I've given you the radiation that we're using. We're using copper k alpha radiation, which has that wavelength. And you know that copper is FCC, therefore your peaks must be either all even or all odd. This one's a little tricky. How would you get started on this? Yeah, you're going to need to pick some HKL values that first off satisfy this expression, all even or all odd. So somebody give me a peak, or a, a HKL values that do that. Okay, zero, zero, zero doesn't count. That's not a peak. That's not a plane, because you can't draw that. Right? That, there's no way you can draw that. Because there's no plane that intersects all those at infinity. It's going to intersect one of them. So give me a peak, or a, a plane, I guess. One, one, one. Okay, so if you're talking about the one, one, one plane, we could calculate where the d-spacing is by just plugging in one and one and one and the lattice parameter, right? However, if you want d to be, well, first off, if we're going from smallest to largest, do we want large d values or small d values? These ones over here will be large values on this end and then getting smaller for spacing, interplanar spacing. So we're looking for the largest value for our interplanar spacing. In order for this to be large, do we want h squared plus k squared plus l squared to be large or small? We want it to be small, right? Therefore, when you do one squared plus one squared plus one squared, let's turn that into h squared plus k squared, plus L squared, that equals H, okay? Can we think of anything that's smaller than that? Let's just, let's just keep writing a few things. What else, give me all even or all odd combinations. How about like zero, zero, two? That's all even. Well, zero, zero, two, when you do H squared plus K squared plus L squared, that equals four. So we expect the one, one, one to occur before the 0, 2, right? Yeah. Zero, zero, one. Zero, zero, one. Oh, that's, that's even and odd. Yeah, what do you think? Negative one, one, negative one. Good question. Negative one, one, negative one. Negative one, one, and negative one. When you square those, that still adds up to three. So what that means is that you're actually going to see reflections at the same two theta value for your one, one, one family of peaks, as well as your negative one, one, negative one. And what that, that's one of the reasons why that, this is going to be a really intense peak, because there's a big family of peaks that all occur at one two theta value. So it turns out to be a really intense one. What other ones come up? What about like two, two, two? Let's just write these. Two plus two, plus, well, two squared plus two squared plus two squared is going to be 12. So that's not going to be our first peak for sure. That's much larger. What about, uh, yeah, 022? Oh, two, two. That one's going to occur at eight. Right? 
Um, you could do 333, three, three, but that's going to be bigger. That's going to be, what is that, 27, 9 plus 9 plus 9. Have we gotten everything? I think that's all of them. So if you then were to rank these things going from smallest D to largest D, sorry, largest D to smallest D, therefore smallest H A squared to the largest, you'd say that this should be your first peak. And your second peak is going to be this one. And then uh, this should be your third, unless I've missed one. No, I think that's right. Therefore, you expect that to be your third peak, 022. OK? Any questions on this? Yeah? Were you just arbitrarily <coughs> picking numbers in arbitrary order? We arbitrarily, we were just picking everything that we could think satisfies the all even or all odd. If we missed one, that's going to mess this up. But we haven't missed one. So a little bit of practice, you can do this. Something like this takes time, and it's not something I would put it on a midterm, but it's totally fair game for our homework. Well, yep. 3-1-1. Three, one, one. Let's try 3-1-1. One, one. Ooh, we missed that one. Three one one. That's going to be three squared. That's nine plus one plus one. That's actually eleven. So that would be our fourth peak, but it's not less than eight. So that would be our fourth peak. Yeah, Conlon or Spencer. Yes, H K N L. By definition, if we go back up to how we defined H K N L to our planes up here, if it came out to something that wasn't an integer, like in this case, this one, it came out to one third, one half, negative one. We multiply it by a common denominator in order to make it an integer, right? In that case, we ended up with three, two, negative one. So yeah, they will always be integers. Okay, any questions on that? So that's how, for example, I could say, give me the fifth peak of something. And if you knew the HKL rules, you could do it. It'd take a little bit of time, but it's not the worst thing ever, okay? Okay. Let's talk briefly about non-crystalline materials. Um, non-crystalline materials are things like glass, right? That's what we typically call them. Glass um, is actually, it has an analog, meaning another, it has a polytype structure, which is uh, crystalline. We call that quartz. So fancy quartz like dinner glasses, that's this structure. Where again, what's our basic building block? Anytime you have silicon and oxygen, you know the basic building block is this SiO4, um, 4, four minus tetrahedra. How those things link together tells you what the structure is, right? In this case, they link together to make these sort of hexagonal nets that are very high symmetry and crystalline. But you can also take those same things and instead of putting them together in a nice organized way, you can just make a jumble. Where maybe on average it looks like there's six members per ring, but that's not guaranteed to be the case, right? They're kind of disordered. So this is glass, like window glass. Well, that's the basis of it anyways. Um, whereas the other one is fine crystal, right? Now, how do you make a material that could otherwise crystallize in a, in a crystallized manner like this be amorphous? You add things like network modifiers. They create the network that you're looking for. Network sounds like it's organization, but it's not. It's actually a measure of disorder here, right? So we add things like calcium oxide or sodium oxide because they mess up the perfect lattice, right? Another thing you can do is you can put in things like boron, which only creates three bonds instead of four. You put boron in there and that can mess it up as well. When you add boron, so borosilicate glass, it also lowers the melting point, making it easier to process. Actually processing pure SiO2 into glass is tricky because it melts at really high temperatures. Quartz melts over a thousand degrees Celsius. You want to melt it at much lower temperatures. So they add things like sodium, boron, calcium, things like that that will lower the melting point. Yeah, Rosa? No, good guess though. The, the dye, I mean those technically are. I don't know if they modify the structure, but they certainly interact with light in a different way than SiO4 does. Um, before we can talk about light and how it interacts with materials, we've got to get to a later chapter in chapter 12, so I'm going to skip it for now. But we will talk about how light interacts with materials to make things different colors. Okay, um, that's all I'm going to say about that for now. Can I answer any general questions about amorphous versus crystalline? Again, if you look at this, Every SI molecule, every SI atom is bonded to the correct number of oxygens. They're not showing the one coming out of the plane. It should have four neighbors, right? Um, but they're not necessarily in a nice regular arrangement. Therefore, this thing, we can imagine planes of atoms like that plane and that plane, and therefore we've got some interplanar spacing. You don't have that here. It's just random. 
You're in your planar spacing. There's no planes to pick from. So therefore, you do not see any X-ray diffraction when you scan amorphous materials. So on the homework, one of the questions on like the fine art thing it asks why you can't see one of the colors, right? If you don't see any X-ray diffraction, a pretty good guess is that there's no crystalline organized structure. It must just be a jumble of atoms, an amorphous material. Okay. Okay, let's keep going. So let's switch gears to polymers now. We've got 15 more minute, minutes. So I don't know how far we'll get, but what I want to introduce is the idea that polymers are all around us and that they're one of the most interesting, important classes of materials out there, even though I don't work on them very much. Um, you can predict properties of polymers if you know things about their chain length or what the side groups are or if there are big side groups at all. Um, we'll talk about how polymerization occurs. How do you go from something not being a polymer to your finished product, which is a polymer? And I doubt we get much further than that. So to start with, on Wednesday, we have a pretty awesome demo. It's a little bit terrifying for us to do, so hopefully it'll be here on Wednesday. But we're going to show you what happens on the inside of a can of Coke, so we'll come back to that later. For now, let's talk about what are polymers. Polymers come in two different varieties. There are natural polymers, things that nature makes for us, and there are synthetic ones, right? Natural polymers are things like wool, right? Any plant fibers. We could go on and on. There's natural rubber, right? Way before we figured out how to make synthetic rubber, they were making rubber out of the rubber tree, right? However, in not very long, really in the last like less than 100 years, we went from having no synthetic polymers to having an enormous number. And every day we're discovering new and more interesting synthetic polymers, right? And it has completely revolutionized. In fact, I think it's one of the things that made material science a field of engineering that we can now make so many different interesting types of polymers with such different properties. And in general, polymers are pretty great because they're inexpensive, mostly. They're versatile, meaning you can make them do different things, and they're really easy to process. Most of these things melt at low temperatures, so you can do things like injection molding at really low temperatures. Um, here's a rough timeline again. We've known about some polymers for a long time, but it wasn't really until like 1800s that Charles Goodyear figured out the process of vulcanization, which we'll talk about later. And that made a rubber go from natural rubber to now a thermoset rubber. In the early 1900s, we discovered Bakelite. Bakelite is, was the first fully synthetic thermoset. We're going to describe thermosets versus thermoplastics later in this chapter. By 1933, so right around World War I era, we've got polyethylene discovered. Um, 1940s and 45, that hit mass production. Polyethylene was everywhere. In fact, a lot of the things, if you look on polymers, and you ever look at the uh, little recycle symbol, this one says... ABS and it's a little triangle there. That's telling me what polymer it is so I know how to recycle it. If it says PE or HDPE, LDPE, those are talking about different grades of polyethylene. You've got polypropylene that hits the scene in the 50s, followed by polystyrene, polyvinyl chloride, PVC, as in the stuff that pipes are made of everywhere, didn't even show up until the 70s. But I mean, we're taking this for granted because you guys were born in like, I don't know, 90s. This is amazing. This is like in our lifetimes that stuff that is now all around us that we take for granted was actually discovered not very long before that. After the 70s, we came up with conductive polymers. The new Samsung phone, they've shown it, folds in half, right? It's a, it doesn't have to be like a glass semiconductor thing. It's, it's organic material so they can be flexible while still being semiconductors. So just incredible stuff. There already are TVs that you can buy that if you have a flat wall, great. And if you have a curved wall, you can bend the TV to make it fit on that. So polymers are doing just bonkers stuff. If you don't find it bonkers, I don't know what's wrong with you because it's amazing, right? Oh, that doesn't belong here. Oh, but speaking of announcements, I will hold a test review this week on Wednesday. Yeah, Wednesday from 5 to 7 will be in this room, right? So test review. The study guide is up. I need to add one or two things. I had the TAs take it, and they're making me change a few things. So I will post the finished up study guide by tonight. Yeah. I don't know if they're planning on doing one on Thursday. Emily, are you guys planning on doing a study guide, a study session on Thursday? Possibly. Watch for an announcement. Okay. Okay, let's start. The most simple polymer molecules are our hydrocarbon molecules, right? So most polymers, not all of them, but the vast majority are organic, meaning that they contain carbon or are based on carbon. They almost all include uh, covalent bonding, right? And if you look at carbon, carbon can have four bonds because it has four electrons, so it wants to share with four other carbons, which is why when we draw polymers, we usually draw like the zigzag structure. Every one of these little corners is a carbon atom, 
And we know that carbon wants to have four bonds, so it's got two in the chain, and then you can have different side groups, right? <coughs> so those can be hydrogen, but they can be other things, right? But that's what we're talking about. We draw this zigzag, we're saying carbon is bonded to four, and because it's carbon bonded to four and it's a tetrahedra, we know that this angle, that angle right there is 109.5 degrees, right? That's why it's zigzag, because geometrically it has to be, because these are tetrahedron that are linking together, okay? So you can have lots of different polymers um, just based off of carbon. You can have ethylene. Ethylene is carbon um, double bonded to another carbon with hydrogen side groups. If you do the math and you count up the number of bonds, carbon each has four bonds. Hydrogen's just got one bond, right? So that's ethylene. You can have acetylene, like the stuff you uh, weld with, like an acetylene torch, uses carbon triple bonded to itself and then with hydrogen on the side. Why do you think that they use acetylene torches instead of ethylene torches? Yeah, Rob? Because it requires more energy to break those bonds, so it burns on it. It burns, that's exactly right. That's a stronger bond, therefore when you break that bond, it generates more heat. So it's a hotter burning torch, right? It's an acetylene torch, okay? Again, if, this was a, if these were saturated molecules, then there would only be single bonds, and we'd replace the single bonds by adding more hydrogen to this thing. That's how we'd get carbon to have four bonds still. Okay, you have the paraffin family. You've ever heard of paraffin wax, right? Earwax, beeswax, these are all in the paraffin family. Um, you can start with methane. Methane is the simplest one. That's just one carbon. Therefore, it's carbon bonded to four hydrogens, right? CH4. You can have ethane, which we already showed you is C2H4. You can have propane, now it's easier to just draw them. You've got three carbons, right? So you've got carbon, carbon, carbon. You're gonna have three hydrogens, two hydrogens, and three hydrogens. You can have butane, one, two, three, four carbons, right? You can just keep on going, but these are all assuming like linear polymers. What do you think the properties do as you increase the chain length? And why, more importantly? Well, you can see what they do. As chain length increases, you see a rise in both the melting and the boiling point. So turn to a neighbor, and talk about why might that be the case. Why is it when you make these chains longer and longer, why do you see a difference in melting point and boiling point? Okay, who's got a thought? Who wants to... Rob, what do you think? What might be going on there? Uh, increased chain length means increased federal forces. You're exactly right. Longer chain, longer <laughs> or increased van der Waals forces. How come? Um, you have more hydrogen interacting with each other. Yeah, right. So imagine you've got these chains, right? You're getting really long, longer chains. That means if there's another chain nearby, these things can have bonding in between them. The shorter they are, the weaker those forces are going to be. So that's exactly right. Yeah, Arthur? Is there a relationship? Uh, yes, we will get to that later, actually. Yeah, there is. What do you expect it to be? If they're, if they're bound together more, you expect a lower viscosity. Yeah. Right? Viscosity is basically how easily you can like uh, cause material to shear. So shearing is moving things past one another. If they're bonded more strongly, they won't do that as easily. So if you go, if you, if you say take like, if you want different motor oil, different vis viscosities, and you make it a higher molecular weight, so you make this chain longer, you will have a higher viscosity motor oil, which they use for different temperatures, right? Okay, um, how about this one? Oh, I forgot to clear the question. Let me skip this first one, skipping it. We'll come back to that on Wednesday. Um, how about this one? Would butane or isobutane have a higher boiling point? Here's the difference. In butane versus isobutane, you've got four carbons. In one case, you've got that, one, two, three, four. That's butane. And in isobutane, you've got that, carbon, 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 carbon. Which one should have a higher boiling point, butane or isobutane? Butane or isobutane? Again, boiling point, 
you're going to cause things to separate, so stronger forces should have higher boiling points. So A or B, butane or isobutane? Okay, answers in, butane or isobutane, what do we think? I'm gonna wrap it up. A or B. Okay, people think, people think butane, right? The re that's right, and the reason why is because if you've got these little stars, those don't overlap as much. In order to have a high van der Waals or secondary bonding, you want these chains to overlap as much as possible. And having that group sticking out the side prevents them from overlapping as much, okay? Now, you can have more than just carbon and hydrogen in polymers, right? In fact, some of the most interesting ones, polyvinyl chloride, right? You've taken out some of your hydrogen, you've put a chlorine ion in. So you can have lots and lots of different side groups. It could be a methyl group on the side, that's like what happened here, right? Your side group is a methyl ion, a CH, a CH3 ion, right? It could be an ethyl group, a phenyl group, it could be an alcohol group, it can be a, all sorts of different things, right? So we're not going to go into detail in this class on the different organic radicals. You don't need to memorize them or anything. They have a table in the book, I think, of these different things. But when you add different organic side groups, other different radicals, it does change the properties. Alcohols all tend to behave in a similar way because they have that same end group, right? The OH group at the end. Okay, let's talk about polymer molecules. Polymer molecules are typically much larger than these small hydrocarbons, right? So if you've got like a butane or a propane stove at home, that's cooking using the combustion of a pretty small molecule. But the polymers that are making up our calculator cases and the base of this and everything all around us, they typically tend to be much, much, much bigger molecules. Instead of being three or four carbons, they might be 10,000 or even a million, right? They're really long chains of carbon, generally. They don't have to be, but they can be really long, okay? Um, in fact, that's what the word polymer is coming from. Poly meaning many, mer meaning uh, what units or parts. So polymer, many parts come together to create this thing. So the question is, how do you go from a monomer, meaning one part, right? The individual thing that creates a polymer. How do you go from that monomer to create a polymer, right? Um, I think we show it right here, right? So let's say you start with ethylene, right? This molecule here. If you start with that thing, in order to turn it into polyethylene, right? Ethylene turning into polyethylene, many things of that. You clearly see that in polyethylene, we don't have any double bonds. So you have to do something. You have to introduce something that is going to attack that double bond, right? So if you bring in something like a bromine free radical, it's got that one electron that just wants to react really badly. That electron is going to come and it's going to attack this bond and it's going to create bromine bonded to carbon, bonded to two hydrogens, and now that has a, uh, a free radical itself. It's missing a bond. So it's going to see another ethylene molecule over here, right? And this one is going to attack that one, and it's going to keep on going. So sometimes you'll hear chain polymerization. Maybe you've heard that term before, chain polymerization. It's a chain reaction, right? You introduce something that starts the polymerization process, and then that creates another free radical and that grabs another monomer, monomer and it keeps on going, right? And there's a whole engineering field on polymers, right? That people get really good at controlling that reaction or changing it to give them the different side groups or alternating groups or whatever they're looking for. Um, and since we're just about out of time, let's see. Yeah, we'll pick up here next time and we'll talk about some of the more specific types of polymers. Uh, quick question though. How long does that take? How long does that take? Really good question. In fact, if you want a really, really long chain versus a short one, you can vary the time by changing the amount of bromine that you add. But I, it just depends on your system and the temperature it's happening and how long it takes. It can be very fast or it can take days. When we introduce uh, that bromine, would that just be like an, another sort of nucleation happening? Um, that's, a, that's a clever way to think of it. It is a type of nucleation and it proceeds not in the same way that a grain grows, but um, a similar concept. Okay. Also
So I was thinking in terms of um, sorry, I was, uh, I was trying to think in terms of um, surface energy and how everything wants to lower its potential energy. Okay. Um, we know that the sphere.